as Courtney mentioned, my name is Marty Johnson. I work at a company uh, in New York called Live Theatrics. And what we do is we work with authors and licensing house on the adaptations, the school editions or the Broadway Junior adaptations of musicals. And about two and a half years ago, we got a call from our wonderful friends at Samuel French and said, hey, we would like to um, do Heathers as a high school version. And I said, oh, that would be amazing. Let's talk to the authors and make sure they want to, because they're going to be the ones who have to do all of the work. Um, we're just there to support them. And so thankfully they said yes. And not only did they say yes to that, they said yes to coming to Lincoln to talk with all of you guys. So I'm going to introduce now Kevin Murphy. And <laughs> Lawrence O'Keefe, <laughs> and then the uh, last person on our panel um, filled in that last slot was, hey, once we have this show, will a high school actually do it, and can we find them, and will this all work? Um, and that person was Heather Biddle from J.J. Pierce High School. Yeah. <laughs> Heather actually directed the production you guys will all be seeing tomorrow. Wow. Um, so hello to everyone out in Facebook Live world um, and all of our Facebook friends. Um, and so we're going to start um, with the two in the middle since they're responsible for Heather's a Musical. I thought that's a great place to start. Um, how did this happen? Why did this happen? I answered this question in the last panel. So origin story, go. <laughs> Dan Waters had a very bad time in high school. He grew up in the middle of Ohio, the most, I don't know, American place in the world, and was so traumatized by the cruelty that he saw in the very late 70s and early 80s that he wrote a screenplay called Heathers, which that became Heathers the movie, and which changed the world. It wasn't a big hit at the time, uh, but it's become the foundation of our entire culture ever since. Without Heathers, there's no Clueless, there's no Gossip Girl. Without Heathers, there's no Mean Girls. There's also probably no Kardashians, no Paris Hilton, um, no Pretty Little Liars. And it, it did this, it changed the world. It was blowing the whistle on a lot of the lies of the 1980s. But it was also so dark and so nihilistic in some ways and so incendiary that it wasn't a big uh, hit at the time. It didn't make a lot of money in theaters, but it became this sort of like cult, this, this sort of I, a foundation of our culture ever since. Kevin and I saw it in theaters when we were very small, and uh, it changed our lives, and it, it sort of taught us, wow, we are terrible nerdy kids, we're, we're horrible uh, losers, but we are not alone. There's other people just as scared and angry as we are. And so it meant something to our generation, and then we got the opportunity to turn it into a musical because the rights finally got untangled, and we figured out who had the rights, and uh, friends of ours, Andy Cohen, Todd Harris, and Amy Powers, got a hold of the rights, because they work in Hollywood, and said, well, who would we want to do it? And they went to their old friends, Andy Fickman and Kevin Murphy. Kevin had written uh, Reefer Madness, Andy Fickman had directed it, Andy Fickman is also the director of She's the Man, <laughs> and Parental Guidance, is that what it is? And, and the Game Plan. And the Game Plan, and all these great movies, but he's a theater guy through and through. They would already done Reefer Madness, and then they said, who would you like to do the music, and who would you like to help co-write co it, and they said, Larry O'Keefe, that's me. Um, <laughs> the short version is that I was reluctant to come on board because we had both done fun, campy, bloody shows, Reefer Madness and Bat Boy, both end with the stage littered with bodies, ha ha, very funny. And so <laughs> we, we thought, you know, I, I had gone on to other shows, um, and so had Kevin, and so Heather's was tempting, but also was, it felt like there were some pitfalls. For example, the world has changed. In 1989, Heather's was a great antidote to a lot of conventional wisdom. It said, no, the things you believe in are not automatically true. American high schools are not automatically a kind place. Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club are not how kids really treat each other. Heather's was a whistleblower, as I said, and it was also pointing out what's worst about us. It was pointing out what's wrong with our culture in many cases. But, you know, 30 years later, we know what's wrong. And there, we have a whistleblowing culture. We have a culture of pointing out what's wrong. It's, it's much more that way. And so what, I asked, would Heathers add to that conversation? 
is could we go a step past it? Could Heather's actually recommend something good that we should do with ourselves, with our lives, instead of just stopping the cruelty? Um, so we were reluctant, but we did uh, sort of hammer out some cool ideas for it. And I think the first song we worked on was called My Dead Gay Son. <laughs> um, that was sort of like our first guess. We sort of took a four, we, we took a sort of like a, our, our dipped our toe in the pool to see if we could come up with a, a Heather's that suited what we like to see in musical theater, and wasn't just a clone of the movie. Yes, that is a thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I, th I think that I think that one of the uh, one of the early challenges for the, there is a, the, the the slightly longer version is it was a it, it was a process, and I think that uh, Andy and I tried very hard to get Larry on board, and Larry kept saying, "Yeah, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced." And there was a series of summits with uh, Larry and I, with me trying to convince him because I was I was hell bent on. Hornswoggling him into doing this thing because he's, he was he was the guy I wanted to work with. Uh, and what was really great about that process was it really challenged me to defend the passion I had for doing this show by convincing him. Because if I couldn't convince Larry, together we weren't going to be able to convince the rest of the world. And a lot of work was done in those in, in those early days where there, there was uh, an early draft of Dead Gay Son, which was which was essentially, it was a very kind of fun uh, concatenation of uh, uh, naughty gay double entendres, uh, but there wasn't a lot more there there. And it was a complete solo. Yes, and what, uh, what we discovered together was, well, what if we made this a moment where we, d we discovered that the two dads actually had had this sort of breakthrough uh, moment that neither of them truly understood on a fishing trip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think we arrived at that because we thought, well, We've both done fun gospel -y numbers in which somebody lets the audience know what they've learned. That we've, you know, the original draft of the song was a dad going, I was wrong, my son was a good person, and I love him, and now he's up in gay heaven. And that, that, was, that was the extent of it. But then we realized, well, every great song that we love in show tune land is usually a sort of a one-act play in itself, with beginning, middle, and end, and with surprises in it. So what could the surprise be? And we realized, well, there were two kids that died, so there were, they had two dads. Why not have the other dad? Oh, and why not have the second dad not be ready, not have learned, not be willing to, you know, to love his dead gay son? And the two dads have to argue and fight it out. And then Kevin had the fun idea of, <laughs> should we do the spoiler alert? <laughs> how, many, how many of you have listened to musical. the music? How many do you, okay, thank you. How many do not know what we're talking about with this particular song? All right, oh, you're in for a treat, my friend. <laughs> thank you. All right, strap in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, should we give it away, spoiler alert? Yeah. Go. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, you know, the dad's, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, the, dad, the dad's, dad's kiss, and that becomes the big turn yes. of the song. And um, I think what was, really helpful with that is it helped us understand that you can take all of the dark events of the movie and you can find a way to rephrase them dramatically in a way that is positive. And that's what happens in Dead Gay Son. And I think that you can look at examples of that throughout the score, that when Veronica is told she isn't gonna, she's finished at Westerberg and she's not gonna play any more reindeer games, uh, she decides, oh, I, I'm going to go seek out that hot kid that I met that beat up the jocks, and I'm going to indulge in uh, a little bit of therapy. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm going to find it. But, but the thing is, it is, it, is, it, is, it is a way of expressing that idea and expressing it in a, in a positive manner. Uh, you, you, and, and you see that again with, with Martha. She's singing a song. There's a version of a song like Kindergarten Boyfriend where it could be, well, I'm here and I'm contemplating suicide because woe is me, my life is so incredibly sad. She doesn't do that. She says, okay, there is a thing that I used to identify earlier in my life that made me feel good. I'm going to create a new dream. Now, it's a bad thing and you know, we, you know, the show is, is, is clearly not condoning suicide, but it is expressing that idea in a positive manner because it's a song about Martha building something that she's building a new dream. Now, of course, we don't want Martha to do that, and we're very relieved when she fails, but 
it's finding those ways to, to positive. Like JD, when he sings Freeze Your Brain, um, he doesn't sing about, I'm so sad because my dad is probably abusive and, and neglects me and drags me from town to town. He says, I found a solution. And the solution is, I go to this convenience store where everything looks the same, and I feel a sense of reassurance about this. And then I take a big, giant pull on a Slurpee, and that momentary oblivion that I feel is very, very pleasurable. And momentarily, it lets me forget who I am and where I am exactly, and that gets me from moment to moment in my life. And that is what I offer to you, cute girl that I like that is talking to me in, in, in the convenience store. We, we kind of stumbled on this sort of philosophy about how to write a show. How many of you guys would say that you are interested in or have tried writing a song or a show or a, a play or some kind of narrative? Raise your hand. That's great. That's fantastic. You should do it more. Do it again. And when you look at the page and say, oh, that sucks, know that we've been in exactly the same place, often to each other. Um, <laughs> and, um, but I mention this because the philosophy is that, I don't know if it's true for other art forms, but for musical theater, if you can say something positive, no matter how weird or negative the situation, it'll sing better. My favorite show recently has been La Caja Fall, which is a strange show, and in some ways it's creepy, but it's also, the secret weapon of that is every single song in that show mentions or dwells on a positive. Even when that's a lie, in the case of um, Song of the Sand, or when it is an indictment, like a song called uh, Look Over There. If you just look at that score and you, and you also read the script, you realize, wow, the songwriter found a way to find the nugget of positivity or forward motion in every situation, even though these situations are full of ugliness or lies or resentment. And, it's, and that, was a, that was a very useful thing for us and Heather's. And the short version is, he convinced me with things like positivity, with things like forward motion, because Anytime you're adapting something from another medium, you have to add value. Otherwise, if you're doing an exact clone of the movie, then just go get it on iTunes for $4 instead of paying $100 to see it in a Broadway theater. But um, we'd also been wanting to work together forever because this guy, he's the Desperate Housewives guy, he's the Ed guy, he's the, the Defiance and Caprica guy, he's amazing. And so um, that's the other thing, find friends. Even friends you didn't think you would write something with, whoever you enjoy hanging out with, whoever, Whoever it's easy to hang out with, try just write something with them. You could, you know, on your phone, film it, anything. You, yeah, you're you're down there. Uh, yeah. yeah. And when yeah. you met, what were you yeah. doing? Oh, what? me personally. No, no, when no. They no. met. Yeah, but they. Yeah. I was, I probably eating dinner. Yeah. Kevin and Larry, what were you doing? Do we do we first meet uh, at, at refer auditions? Yeah, oh yes. When yes. we first met, they were doing Reefer Madness auditions, and uh, I volunteered to come in and help out with auditions. And I got to see some very strange auditions. Okay. But, but my point with that is, he volunteered to be yeah. in a room where people were doing something that he thought was cool. He was probably himself, what he was, he wasn't trying to force anything, and he met someone who's like, oh, that's a good person, 10 years down the line, 5 years down the line, whatever it is, I want to go back and work with them. It was, it Every, was everyone you meet at some point is going to potentially do that. I just thrown that out as a yeah. as a little tidbit. So you did the show, you wrote the, you got the show, you take it to LA off Broadway. Yeah. So, so actually, here's this is something that came up in the other panel, and it's it's something also because because you you this room is largely with people who have you know hopefully very you know bright careers ahead. Is there's a couple of ways that you can approach doing a musical. And there's the version where, uh, you know, big producers come in, and this is this is how it happened with Legally Blonde, and they audition they audition people. Larry and Nell, um, you know, had had to compete with probably what like twenty other songwriting teams to yeah. get that job, and that's kind of like a day job in some ways because the people who are the actual muscle in the production are uh, are, are the producing entity because they're the ones that are paying the bills. Now the good side is they also pay you for doing that, which is lovely. Uh, we did Heather's by the, the same, the same um, paradigm that Andy Fickman and I did uh, with Dan Studney, uh, we, we, that we did Reefer Madness. And that was something that we, uh, we did a DIY, we did it in a very uh, cheap uh, theater in, in, uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard, and we paid the bills ourselves. And we cast people that we liked. Uh, we got favors from friends, and we mounted the whole thing ourselves, and when we lost money, 
it was all of us getting in a circle with a gut check, basically taking out our wallets and writing checks to get us through the next through the next week. And we managed to keep the show alive, Reefer Madness alive like that for uh, for a year and a half run, which in Los Angeles is a you know astronomically long run. And you know the, sh the show went so when we were working on Heather's, we wanted to do that same approach because it, nobody paid us to write Heather's initially. We, we eventually got paid. But it would allow us to keep complete control because Larry and I did not want to have to deal with arguing with people who had power over us about how you cannot do uh, a gun in school. I do they have to be mean to each other? We didn't want to have fights about, like, do you have to have four deaths? It's like, uh, you know, do you, do you want to, you know, you know is, is, is it, is it or we don't want to be told by Fiat that JD can't wear a black trench coat just because, uh, you know, you know Dylan do, Klebold wore, 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 wore a, a black trench coat. And that was something that was really important because we knew that we were working with such incendiary subject matter that if we had to deal with the fear of people who had power over us financially, we probably weren't going to have a show that was worth us spending our time on because we were going to have a miserable time and we were going to be like fighting. So we made a decision that because we really cared about the thing, we weren't going to take a paycheck up front. So we had producers, but the producers knew that you know Larry at this point had like a like a you know like a Tony nomination that we were getting people who actually had experience and we were doing the show for free. But what we required in re in return was creative autonomy. And we gave it, and our producers were amazing partners. Larry and I were producers, and Andy Fickman was a producer. So I would say for those of you out here who see yourselves writing, there is sometimes value in doing things small. Like, get friends with a camera, and if you can't afford to do a full production, do one number from it. Uh, if, if you look, if you, if you search, uh, you know, because people presumably here know, know, know Heather's, if you look up uh, Youth YPC on, on um, on YouTube, you see an amazing music video uh, that this, uh, this 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 dance group has put together of Candy Store, and it's it's astonishing. And if we had thought of that, we might have been able to not do our. We, we could have just maybe shot a really cool music video and, 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 not, and not spend quite some money on our, on our Los Angeles developmental productions. But but I think that it's that, like there's a lot of value if you can't get to the big Scott Rudin producers of the world, there are ways that you can produce your own material. And that those ways can actually be successful. And I think Heather's is, is proof of that. So successful, got it to New York. And then yes. New York happened and it was lovely. And then you get a phone call or an email from Sam French and they said, hey, high schools. And yes. how, what was the original reaction? Well, we first dealt with Samuel French because they saw the production and they uh, wanted to publish it for Stock and Amateur. And we had great conversations with them, meaning that they're going to be the ones that you go to when your college or your regional theater wants to do it. But they said, and don't count out the high school market. We said, oh, what are you talking about? Please. And they said, no, 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 that's a major reason. Someday, they said, we will do a high school adaptation. We said, you're crazy. Uh, but fine, we'll take your money. And so, <laughs> so we published it, and sure enough, it began to take off in regionals and, and amateur groups. But they kept telling us, we're getting a lot of requests from high schools. And we're like, wow, well, you have to tell them no, because they'll get sued. <laughs> teachers, well-meaning, kind-hearted teachers will get fired for doing this show with all the blood and the craziness. And There's some, something to add to that is what surprised us a little bit when we did the off-Broadway run was the connection that the show was having with younger audiences. I, I think that we, not I think, I know that we originally assumed that our target audience would be people who were roughly in our age range, people who had found the movie, were fans of the movie, who quoted the movie, and that this would be sort of a fun 80s nostalgia trip for people who came of age in the 80s. Basically, they were writing for me. I, I, I thank them for what it. What happened in actuality was people young people started discovering the show on their own, people who really hadn't seen the movie, didn't really care about the movie, and every now and then you would hear people gasp when he switched the mugs with the blue Drano because people didn't know that plot point, which you know, everybody that loves Heather's the movie obviously knows that plot point, but there were people coming in here who had heard about the show through other means and had heard about it online, and what came with that is because often 
young people don't have enough disposable income to you know drop over a hundred bucks on a on a show, you go <coughs> with your parents. And so we were getting parents who were coming in and they were bringing like their their daughters and their sons. Uh, with like birthday party people and they're coming in with like you know their daughter and like nine of their daughter's friends and by the time you get about uh, you know 10-15 minutes into the show you, you then can see that parent sort of slink down in their chair like, oh my god I am the worst parent in the world I can't believe I did this I'm so embarrassed right now it wasn't a totally consistent thing often you'd have a parent going oh that's ho oh, that's terrible. Like going back and forth, vacillating from one scene of something touching or truthful to something. Oh, that's disgusting, and I, I should not have brought my eight-year-old to this. <laughs> um, but it was, a, a, as you can tell, it was a very strong and and enthusiastic re reaction. And so Samuel French said, "You have to do a high school edition now, because these are these are people who want to do your show now, and they can't do." the grown-up edition, but we believe that there's a PG-13 version in there which is so close to the original that it will be everything you, you want out of Heathers with enough of the, the really sharp, jagged edges <laughs> sanded down a bit so that you won't get anyone sued or fired. And we said, okay, what do we do? And then they called in the brilliant uh, Marty and the brilliant uh, people from iTheatrics. And they, they told us what to do, we did it, we held a workshop, it went great, and here we are. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's the funny thing about what we discovered in the process of doing this. Like there was, there was a list of things that for school productions are hot, are hot button issues. It's, you know, that the, there were um, uh, no, no sort of on stage displays of teen drunkenness, no overt uh, sexual material on stage, taking out all the obvious swears, <laughs> taking out, uh, and, and, you know, taking out smoking, smoking on stage, um, and, and and blue balls uh, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Uh, but boys singing about their testicles was right out. Uh, but as we started removing those things from the script and trying to find replacements that were not necessarily lateral moves, but even improvements, we realized that in some places we've been using some of that as a crutch. And the song that ended up replacing uh, Blue is, I think, really superior because Blue, because we were afraid when we wrote it, and you should never write anything when you're afraid, because that's just, you're in the wrong headspace, is that we were afraid that because it, the song's a little date rapey, that it would put a pall on, on the proceedings, so we needed to make sure it was really, really funny. And it was a funny song, but it was very polarizing. And you had a lot of people <clears throat> who, you know, would, would watch the song and they would be crying with laughter, they would be so excited. And then you had other people who were really turned off by it. And as we sort of tried to analyze why is this song so divisive, I think the reason is because in trying to make the song funny, we were turning the reprehensible behavior of the two jocks, we were making it okay for the audience to laugh because we made it almost a little adorable. And I think it's that, it's that old trope about, oh, it's just locker room talk, it's just boys being boys. It, it's making, making that excuse for inappropriate and terrible male behavior. And the other problem with the song is that Veronica doesn't really get a voice. Veronica is, is largely mute during the song, the guys get to kind of show off and preen and strut their stuff, and then her solution is to simply uh, trick them into binge drinking and blacking out, which is not great. So we put <laughs> all solve of that, every problem. So, so, we, so, we, so we put all of that aside, and we tried to start the song from Veronica's point of view. Now what happens is the, girl, uh, the, the girls have made a deal with the guys, and it's just as crappy as what they did in the original musical version, where uh, they made a deal where if they get Veronica to show up, they get the car keys, and they can go the hell home because it's cold out, and, and, and the guys are, are cow tipping in the pasture. And so the girls leave, and now suddenly Veronica realizes she's come here with good intentions, but now suddenly she's out and alone, nobody can really hear her, and she's with these two guys, and she has a little rap at the beginning where she realizes I'm alone in the dark. They took her car keys. They took my car keys away from me, and they're bigger than me, and they weigh a lot more than I do, and they're really not listening to me. I'm now starting to get actually a little scared, because I don't know how I'm going to extricate myself from this problem. And then with that emotional underpinning, then the guys go into another version of preening and showing off, 
but it, where they're not singing about their testicles. But it was, I, I'm, I was so delighted because Kevin solved this problem, which is how do you deal with a scary situation? Previously, we're like, oh, let's make fun, let's be cute about it. And the audience got the impression that we didn't think it was a, a big deal and we didn't think it was that bad. We know it's that bad. We've been to high school. We've gone to high school. We've been teenage boys. We've been friends with teenage boys. And so we knew what they're capable of. We've seen 13 Reasons Why, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so he started putting in these lines, which we have heard our contemporaries say. One of the lines that I've, I've, I'm so proud of him doing was one line where he goes, come back, girl. Now, don't play her if you don't want me staring. Why are you wearing that skirt? And that's, in context, that's terrifying. It also gets a laugh because we recognize it. And then the next line is, uh, the other guy says, we can't be tamed and we can't be blamed. It's all your fault that we're inflamed. And we realized we were, it was right in front of us. Teenage boys, alcohol, football players, ego, hormones. It leads to terrible self-justifying behavior. That these boys, whether temporarily or permanently, think that women are their property. And, oh, there was another line I'm proud of, which is, um, hey, you want it to be popular. So um, we're now, instead of trying to get our laughs and our, and our, our thrills by, by shying away from stuff, we're going right down the middle. This girl genuinely is in danger. She gets to say out loud that she's in danger. And then she gets to solve the problem really actively with a fun surprise, which hopefully you'll all see tomorrow night. But um, hands up, who's see, who's going to see the show tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Woo! yeah. Woo! Woo! Thank you. But we we're very proud of that, and of course, we've already premiered this. It, it, the song showed up at Pierce in, in a a draft, which is almost what you're going to see. But we just did it in London because we were doing no, we a workshop. Have, we have the new one. Yeah, but now yeah. but now you're. Yeah, they yeah. saw the premiere, yeah. right? Last yes, year. I got you. Um, so oh. in London, we did the most recent version of it, and even so, we're getting some people on Twitter going, oh, I saw it, yeah, it was very great, but I really was blue. <laughs> and we're like, not for long, because we're very, very proud of this. But we've, we're still tinkering. The version of Your Welcome, which these brilliant artists did, I guess, last year, we've tinkered with it even a little bit more to give Veronica more of a say, to make it clear how scared she is and also how ingenious she is. So we're on the fourth yeah, I think you'll probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> to, to catch you up a little bit, uh, when they said yes, they started working and changing all of these things. They gave the material to us in New York, and we tested it out with students in New York of age. They came to rehearsals, performances. We saw it um, with the all hope and, and belief that it was going to work, but also aware that if we saw it in front of all these people and it wasn't right, if it still felt uncomfortable, either changes we made or, or we could stop the process. Thankfully, it went really well. They came back with more changes. We did all those things. We're like, great, we're in this incubator now. Now we have to get it out into the real world and see how the general public is really looking at this, which is where Heather came in. So um, I had worked with Heather on uh, other projects, and so I said to her, Heather, we have this opportunity. We'd love you to pilot and test out Heather's the high school edition, Heather's the high school edition, the very first one. Um, can you get your administration to say yes to a show that must have guns on stage? Yeah, that was the first thing you said. You, he was like, can you use gun, a gun? Because you have to have guns on stage. Have to have a gun. Those are part of the stories that can't go away, and, and nor would we want them to go away. When, when we're making that adaptation, the goal is not to change anything, it's to find out what they have and what's essential and then break it down like they said. So, by the way, here's all the things that happened in it. Well, your administration said yes. <coughs> and then Heather took over and her principal left. So that was really... <laughs> before, before. This is the... <laughs> it was like, no, I'm leaving. Um, no, so I, I was a Heather, obviously. Not a bad one, but I grew up. And Heather's was like my life, 89. I know, right? I was, you know. But, um, so uh, I knew immediately when the show... The original, loved it, I wanted to do it. I applied, actually. I don't know if I, we ever went through that, but I applied for the high school, for the real one. Because I was like, I'm just going to do it. I think I thought I would do it in the summer, maybe, and like just pretend like it wasn't really happening. <laughs> don't tell my administration that. Um, they're live tweeting it. Um, but, but so I, 
I, I really didn't have a principal very last year we had a, a new principal and he literally started like May 15th and we had been in talks for a couple of months before that and the, the on-stage gun thing wasn't an issue. We did West Side Story a few years before, used live blanks, um, and that wasn't an issue with our district at all. Um, well, and, it's Texas. Right, exactly. <laughs> 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 people have them in their cars and locked up, so it's fine. No, exactly, it is kind of sad. But no, some, so, no, some school districts, it's a no, 100%. But um, so my, my new principal comes, he seems like a good guy, so I was like, Hey, uh, it's your first day here. Welcome. I need to talk to you about this show that I want to do, and no one will talk to me about it because they wanted to make sure it was the guy who was running the school next year. And um, he said, okay, and he's uh, just a couple years older than me, so he knew the show, Heather. As I said, it's a brand new show. Um, we're going to be the first in the country to do it. It's pretty amazing. Like, we were asked out of the entire country, so come on, say yes. And he immediately was like, okay, I love Heather's. I love this idea. But I'm brand new. I just started today. So I'm going to have to ask the next person. So they went up to the next person. And the next person was like, you know, Heather, we really like you. We really want to respect you. And we want to give you this opportunity. But, oh, there's all these things. So we're going to go to the next person. So the process really in our district is not quite like that. It's kind of like one faculty member reads it, a parent who's a part of the theater program, and then an outside parent. And then the principal. And that's sort of the end of it. But it went over and over and over. And they finally, about a year ago, got a, an email that said, okay, it's going to happen, um, so, so go for it. Um, we had a couple of, like, and, and from the beginning, like, <coughs> my philosophy on the show, especially after I got to read the high school edition, um, and I, I think that both Kevin and Larry hit on it a couple of times, the heart and the message of the high school edition is... It's just, I mean, it's beautiful, and it's always feels campy saying that because of the make it beautiful. Um, but it's so true, and it truly, like, it speaks to kids. It speaks, it reminds parents that not every day is a great day. And, um, and so I, I started out with the narrative that I wanted to continue, which was the, you know, um, life can be beautiful. We had to put the PG-13 label on it. Um, we weren't allowed to, at the first, at the beginning, our first shows back in September, um, to promote anywhere except for the high schools, our four high schools in our district, and then, you know, outside. But what was so interesting is the middle school kids would come, you know, and their parents would call or email and want to know some information. And once we had, like, real dialogue about it, they were like, these are conversations we want to have with our kids. Like, we want to talk about bullying. We want to talk about the potential of, you know, girls being in situations that they can't control or, or boys. Um, you know, we want to talk about, you know, while it's not really addressed, you know, drinking. Um, and so we ended up having these, like, little <coughs> mini fans, and they're so cute, and they're probably watching, we love you, little sixth grade, oh, no, seventh grade girls. Um, First but, case is free, kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but so, and it was, it really was, and of, of the entire year, and we did the show, this is, uh, what would it be, 13? Thir well, it'll be 12 and 13 here, right? So this is 12, and then we'll have 13. 13 shows, um, especially in our community, there was nothing but positive. I mean, we, my principal one time said he got like a Heather's, it was like Heather's was the, um, the subject know. matter, and he was like, oh no, and he pressed on it, and it was just like glowing, just things about, and like older people, the funniest is like when we have like very older people come to see it, and I was like, oh, this is not Sound of Music, hope you enjoy it, and they loved it, they did, they loved, um, for them it was like, I guess Greece was probably a little little still um, relevant for them, but it was just that kids getting to be kids and, and talking about all the things that they need to talk about. So that's my, that's my five minutes. I'm good. Cool. <laughs> I'm um, good. I know we talked a little about this. Um, if any of you, oh, we didn't mention this earlier. Uh, Kevin and Larry are going to be oh, signing yeah. books and scripts tomorrow from 10 to 1 at the Samuel French table. Okay, so you can meet and talk to them. They're very, very nice, as you can tell. Um, but if you notice on the <laughs> books, and this is uh, one of them, it says, uh, Book, Music, and Lyrics by Kevin Murphy and Lawrence O'Keefe. It's not two, oh, books and lyrics, or music and lyrics. And that's unusual. So do you guys want to talk about sure. how that works, why that works? Um, 
one of the things that happens when you divide up the chores, it's very, very tempting to dig your heels in because there's something lovely about having complete autonomy uh, on one creative element, but when it's a blended partnership, you're forced to agree. And I cannot think of a single example where Larry and I have ended up putting anything in the show that we didn't eventually come to an agreement. We may have tortured each other, we may have <laughs> made, made each other like crazy, we may have had to go back, but what would happen is if Larry would propose something, I don't think it's good enough, then it's incumbent upon me to come up with a line or an idea that, that does work. If there's something in, in the music that I feel isn't landing, uh, and you know, Larry being an accomplished musician and me sucking at it, uh, <laughs> you know, there could be nothing more annoying to Larry than having like my musical notes, and yet yeah. we do it, and it always ends up being better when we come up with something we both unanimously <coughs> are excited about. And it's, I think it's a great way to make a musical because you want to have a musical that feels like it's written by one single voice. It, it, traditionally in the Broadway industry, the, the tradition is no one can change a note of the music except the composer. No one can change a, a single syllable of the lyrics except the lyricist, and no one can change a single line of dialogue except the book writer. Of course, there's tons of exceptions to that, and if you are you know, Harvey Weinstein or Scott Rudin or some incredibly powerful producer, you can change whatever you like. But um, if you're not fighting your own corner, if you don't have a corner you can fight, then you have to clear everything. Nothing gets onto the page without both of you agreeing, yeah, let's try it. And I, I, I kind of like that. Also, I, you know, we known each other for, for years and years, and we knew that we trusted and, and admired each other's uh, styles um, and, and, and talents. So, I, I kind of like that. It, it, it's, a, it's a good thing to try if you, if you know that, that you're going to at least... It, 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 works, it doesn't work in all instances. It works if you really, really trust your partner. And that's part of where, you know, going back to what you know, Larry said earlier, is, is you know, work with people who are your friends. Work with people who you can stand to be in a room for hours and hours and hours at a time. Work with people who will have your back. Work with people that you really feel are family. There's another extra um, method which I think is very important to mention because you can go in with your best friend and ruin it if you if you fight over over <laughs> it and, and it becomes about your individual ego. How do you avoid that? Well, you need a third party thing to work on, meaning you have to agree on a principle. What is your show recommending? What is your show advocating? What is your show saying we should do differently? Hey audience, here's a story. Now that you've seen this story, go home and do something differently with your lives. That's, I, I love the preachiness of musical theater. I don't know if there's any other art form that's quite as preachy, but I love that. You can go home and maybe if you see West Side Story, you go, oh, I, maybe I'll, I'll approach my neighbor who I don't know and who looks different from me differently. Or if I go see King Lear even, although it's not, not the very musical theater, um, you know, we, we go see these shows because it can sometimes give us prescriptions about how to approach a, a new situation differently. So I, I, I love thinking about what is the show advocating. At the very beginning when we started writing this, we said, what is the show pushing or advocating or recommending? All my favorite shows are recommending or advocating something. Maybe we'll talk about examples later, but it, you know, Wicked has like three or four great recommendations about what we should do differently, how should we, we should treat each other differently. Um, a chorus line. Um, Sweeney Todd has a, has a, a very uh, stringent and, and, and dark sort of, uh, that's more like people should stop doing things like <laughs> <laughs> eating each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, like, people in pies. but it is a cure for the unfair classes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in other words, we went looking for what the show was telling people we should do differently or look at differently. And we started out thinking that the, the moral or the message or the recommendation of Heather's is someone's going to be Heather. Someone's going to rule your school or your town or your world. And if you don't like the way your town or school or world or country or whatever is being run, you can't just sit on the sidelines complaining like Veronica does at the beginning of the show. And you can't try to destroy it and burn it all down like JD does. You have to, like Veronica eventually learns to do, you have to stand up, get shot at, um, take your lumps, and say this is wrong, and stand for something better. We thought, oh, this is great, this is wonderful. 
However, I would describe this to people and producers, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, really? Okay. Um, that wasn't <laughs> enough. In other words, when you set out to write your show, take a guess as, as to what you think your show is recommending, but it may not be what you end with. It may not be what you finish the show with. And or sure it may enough, be only partial. Right, it may, it may get you part of the way there. And sure enough, right before we opened, we kind of figured out that there's a, a much more important message, which is about love and forgiveness. Veronica, the real love story of Heather's is not between Veronica and JD, it's between Veronica and her classmates. She starts out the show thinking that her school is one big monolithic monster called school. And she thinks that it's a big thing out to get her. And by the end of it, she realizes by meeting and really getting to know people like Martha and uh, Heather McNamara and other people, she realizes, no, 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 it's made up of individuals. And these people who, who were, I thought were assholes, who were monsters, who were so cruel to me at the beginning of the show, they were scared too. They were abused too. They were incarcerated in the school with me, just like me. And these people who I hated and thought were not worth saving, of course they're worth saving, because everybody's worth saving. So that was a kind of great thing that by, point, by taking a third party I idea, what is our show pushing? What is our show trying to teach? We sort of wrote it, sort of like a constitution of the United States of our show. And <laughs> we kept trying to amend it and make it better. And hopefully by the end, we came up with something that is different from, and hopefully you know, an extra step over and above the movie. Good. And then we did another step over and above the grown-up version, and we learned lessons from the high school version, which we are now putting back into the grown-up version. So, thank you. I, I think, <laughs> I think that, that message of compassion is really important because you can't actually get to compassion with people who are your enemies unless you take the trouble to understand them. And I think if you look at right, like right now, like why is Heather relevant in 2017 any more than it was in 1989? It's because we are all very codified. We're all on social media. We all kind of pick the news channels that sort of reinforce what it is we want to believe. And we all exist in these little kind of individualized, customized bubbles where even like what we search for in, you know, in Google, it, it, it's, it's all like gamed to sort of like show us the things that we like to be shown. And that's, that's, a very that's a very dangerous place to be because you don't really stop and engage with the other people. And I think that happens in a high school environment. And what, what happens to Veronica is by reaching out to McNamara, she discovers, you know what? She's not a monster. There's even a little moment where Heather Duke, when she's it's in the state. It's in the staging. It's like something a blink if you miss the stage direction. But once McNamara and her power base has abandoned her, Duke is sort of like alone and awkward when everyone else is singing beautiful. And there's a moment where the guy who plays uh, like like a beleaguered geek kind of comes over and you know in, in the original production just kind of like takes her hand and you realize that oh there's even redemption for her. It's like there's that moment with the coffins. It's not on the cast album, but uh, where Veronica. Yeah, after there's nothing like seemingly good about Kurt and Ram, but she has a moment and she th and she thinks she's looking at what's happened to them. It's like they could have turned out good, but now we'll never know. They were only seven; they, they were just seventeen. And I think that that is a message that we try at least to reinforce over and over throughout both the adult versions and the one-on-one -on -one version. We try to boil down our shows that we write to a single sentence, including the words "people should blank." And it took us forever, but I think we found one we really like, which is, it includes the word, it goes something like this. In order to fix the things in the world that make you angry, you must let go of your anger. Veronica can't save her school until she, well, she doesn't even want to save her school until she realizes anger in herself has helped kill people. She, it's all very well and good to blame JD, the murderer's boyfriend, but she helped bring it about too. She has to let go of her own anger in order to stop the violence. And we're very proud of, of that particular idea. It's, it's in Heather's The Movie. It's sort of very implicit, Blink, and you miss it, but we, we realize that is probably one of the most useful uh, messages. And we have been trying to bring it out more and more, and the high school edition was a great step that helped us hopefully make it yeah, even more. It's like the message at the end of Act One where Veronica is only halfway through her journey. One of the things I find interesting about the song Our Love is God is 
on one level, it works as kind of teen hyperbole, like I would move mountains for you, our love is bigger than anything, than anything. It's like, you know, we can, you know, you know, you know, we can start and finish wars, we can kill the dinosaurs, you know, we're, we're the asteroid that's overdue. And, and, and you're kind of used to hearing that kind of exaggeration in a love song, that there's nothing here except for me and you, baby. But if you actually tried to actualize that, there's something that's almost psychotic about the self-absorption and the narcissism that comes from that feeling of, of isolation. And, you know, she and, she and JD are comforting each other by fantasizing about basically the obliteration of everyone else in the world except for them, which is not a good way to live your life. <laughs> and JD, because he's JD, says, hey, yeah, let's make that literal. And Veronica did not actually mean that literally. And Act 2 is about Veronica fully understanding the monster that she has just kind of woken up and unleashed and figuring out how she's going to fix it without more people, without more people getting hurt. And I think that that's, that that's all about don't isolate, don't fantasize about the destruction of everyone else, integrate. And I think, you know, as you go into adult world, it's like if you don't like the way the world is, then do a podcast and make your make your voice known. Run for run for school board. Run for elected office and deal with the fact that you're going to get people yelling at you that don't believe in what you say. And then answer them and engage with them because if we can't learn to do that as a society, we're screwed as a society and we'll just be a, a fallen empire. Heather, I know you guys did a lot of community stuff mm -hmm. with different organizations at your school. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we um, we wanted. You know, to make sure that the message that we were, we as a cast kind of came up with as well. And it was, I mean, we came, you know, to the one line of, you know, let's make it beautiful. Um, and then my personal favorite line in the entire show that I said in the last panel is, um, if no one loves me now, someday somebody will. And um, I also cry. I cry every single time when they say it, and they grab hands, and it's like. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that like the community had a a, a place to go and kind of discuss. Um, so we have, uh, which probably some of you have at your schools, like we have like crisis counselors um, that are kind of trained even over like a regular school counselor. Um, and so they were on board. They uh, helped us secure like a bunch of different uh, teen organizations um, also like uh, uh, that were about mental health, some for like drug abuse, alcoholism, um, and then we actually had a couple of different, um, we had a organization that helps um, teenagers that are in abusive relationships. Um, I don't know there's like there's like one in the show, um, sometimes I, it's like not really a, important aspect of there's there's some mental some mental abuse happening and in, in what in a few of the relationships in Heather's. Um, I think there's quite a bit of it. <laughs> I, was, I was kidding. I was, I was being facetious. Um, but we need to work out a signal. For I that. know. Um, there you go. Um, so so we had that and um, I think that was it was great. Um, it was a great also way for the community to feel like they were present and a part of of what was happening and. Um, I think I think someone um, on my board came up with that it's not a musical, it's a movement. Unless that was y'all's. Okay, so it was someone on my someone on my end. Um, so it's it's in our play it's in our playbill made by Playbuilder. Shout out. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's we said it's not a musical, it's a movement um, because it really is. It's it is. Why is it still so important to tell? you know, this story in 2017, and it's because, you know, this, this story continues every day in every high school in America, and, the, and it, it is going to always happen, and I mean, you know, Veronica says, I can't promise no more Heathers. Um, high I school mean, may not high ever. High school may not ever. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm 40. Everyone who thought I was way younger than that, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm 40, and there are still the mean girls, there are still the jobs, there are still if the If no girls. one loves you now, someday somebody will. <laughs> <laughs> Patience. And that day is here. That's <laughs> us. Um, but so, it, it's, so guys love up here on this panel. But um, no, so I think having all of those outreaches and all those places, but the, just the conversations that started between the cast, um, like students, like we're reaching out to them, tweeting 
things to them, direct messaging them, and like we had kids who came to us after Texas Thespians, um, we had kids whose friends had uh, committed suicide and they were saying like how they wished that they had had this message and seen this message of hope because while I think some people see it and they think, oh no, you know, they talk about suicide, but they, they also talk about the redemption and the caring about yourself and allowing others to come into your story and be a part um, of your pain and let, kind of help you through it. Um, so I think that that was just so important. And um, we did actually a lot of group kind of stuff with our cast as well and talking about things and talking about ways to help kids if they came. Um, if they came to them because they kind of know they're the ambassadors of this little mini Heather. They're, they're the mini Heathers. The movement. <laughs> the mini the Heather movement. movement. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to get a chance for you guys to ask some questions, um, which would be amazing. But before we do, um, Winona Ryder, who you all know from Stranger Things, actually did things before that, believe it or not. Um, yeah, it's true. Um, and, and I think there's a, a, a kind of a, a fun story that's just a little sure. like, folk, like you guys should know this because it'll give you a little, a little twinkle tomorrow during the show. So, so Winona uh, came as uh, Dan Waters' date uh, for our, our initial diagnostic four-week uh, run in Los Angeles which I think we did in 2013-ish. Uh, and uh, it was a huge deal. All of the actors were like, holy crap, one on our I'm gonna die. And Larry and I were just sort of on the sidelines with Andy, our, our director, and just, we weren't watching the show. It was like actor schmacker. It was like we were watching Winona react and watch the show. We were watching it, sometimes she would like mouth lines along that she knew and then we would have changed something and then she's like, hey, wait, that's wrong. What's going on? <laughs> um, which is really just watching her engage with the show and she was wonderful. Surprisingly and, and, a good kisser. She was wonderful and generous and she came and hung out with the cast and did uh, Photo opportunities with everyone until uh, you know until everybody had you know gotten their awesome photos for posterity, uh, and then we had a conversation, and she said to me uh, that there was one line that turned out was her favorite line in the show, and it was missing from that production, and I was like, "What line is that, Winona Ryder?" <laughs> and she says, "It's I do not patronize bunny rabbits." <laughs> which was said by the parents in the original movie. And it was just a great way of like, you know, you, uh, you know kids, are, it, was, it was anger from Veronica. It was like, kids do not want to be experimented on like guinea pigs, patronized like bunny rabbits. And all the parent takes out of it is like, I do not patronize bunny rabbits. Um, so it turns out that's her favorite line. And so uh, I'm like, well, Winona Ryder, uh, <laughs> we will put that line back in the show, God is my witness. And I go to Larry, he's like, okay, we got to put the bunny rabbit line in. But the problem was it was in um, the place where it would naturally fit, where it was in the movie, is right in the middle of, um, of, 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 Yo, of Yo Girl. And by that point, everything's sort of chugging to the, to the, to the finale and having mom stop down, I don't know, for people who know the movie, mom has her big, great scene about, uh, you know, you think being adult is all, is, is all doubles tennis, and that's where that fits, and it just, it would have just messed up the song and just kind of derailed the momentum of act two, so we couldn't put it there. And then we came up with the idea of, oh, wait, let's give it to the other adult character, let's give it to Mrs. Fleming. And once we put it in Mrs. Fleming's mouth, it was a perfect spot, because it was right where because it was, it, was, it was right where uh, Heather runs out in tears and Fleming is uh, perhaps a little too concerned about the TV cameras having caught all of this and perhaps being a little self-serving and Veronica calls her on the carpet for it, which is a really great sort of hero appalled moment for Veronica. And it works great there and we started getting like, you know, you know, applause from the audience. So when you see it tomorrow, feel free to applaud. No, just, <laughs> um, but that, that, was, that was a great thing. So when you see that, you may get a little warm, gushy feeling in the bottom of your tummy because you'll know that that was Winona Ryder's damn note. <laughs>
Uh, questions for you. Oh, yeah. questions. I like this guy. Yeah, yeah this guy right here. That was like, yes, I have. I was ready. Um, so you guys obviously have some of your favorites that um, favorite additions to the show that you either added during the pre before the actual run or in the process of changing into the Heather's 101. What were some of your either favorite cuts or most upsetting cuts that you had to make. Mm. Oh, I, I thought you were going to ask us what are our favorite lines, but instead we have to do a sad thing. Mm. <laughs> oh, all right, I, I got one. Because okay. this is, this is a, this, let, let, me, let me laud some praise of my partner here. Uh, prior to Candy Store's existence, we had a lovely little charm song uh, that was called Human Connection. And everybody liked it, and it was kind of smart, it was clever, it had like really good naughty bits, and, <laughs> and everybody really liked it. And something was bugging Larry about it, and he kept zeroing in on that song not being good enough. And I, being lazy by nature, was like, well, there's no, and, and the problem is there was no obvious flaw with the song. There was not anything in it that wasn't working. It just was not kicking the show up to that next level in the way that eventually Candy Store came to came to do. And I said, "Well, let me let me uh, let me try something." So he came with like a rudimentary version of of Candy Store, and then when I heard it, I was like, "Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go, let's chase that." So then we worked on that and find it. The difference was that Human Connection was Chandler saying. Hey, we're playing this mean, horrible joke on Martha to educate her, to teach her about the way things work. We're not hurting her. We're helping her improve herself so that she doesn't have terrible misconceptions about the world. We're we're showing her how the we're world really works. We're educating her as to the cruelty of the world. Yeah, and that was a fun idea. But then I realized. Chandler would not waste a second either on that kind of lie or on that kind of self-justification. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a whole song about how wonderful, how, how Heather actually is kind. How actually she's here to help us. And I'm like, that doesn't really sound like Heather Chandler. That, <laughs> Heather Chandler is Stalin. She's basically like... And that was the problem with the song. Obey it, or it, was not, it was not true yeah. to who Heather yeah. Chandler is. So we profited there as in elsewhere in the show by telling the truth, by getting to the point. So Heather Chandler's, we, we realized, oh, Heather Chandler's much more like Lucy Van Pelt from Peanuts. She's like, you know, okay, you're with me or you're dead. Enjoy. And so that, that, was, that was, I was not sad to see that song, but I was like, oh, I'm so excited about this new thing. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was the right move. And I think sometimes it's, yeah. it's about, and I think this was what's great, is because, again, it, it's sharing. It's like if one of us makes a suggestion the other does not actually have the power to be lazy in the meantime. <laughs> it's like we have to take all, you know, all suggestions have to be, have to be, have to be treated equally. And I think that, you know, that's, that's, that's been a really, that's been a really good, you know, role for us. Uh, I will say I did not clearly get a vote in the same way they did, but they appropriately took out my favorite line from the movie, which is, F me gently with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> which is it, but, I knew, like, I mean, it had to go. Mm -hmm. But what they did, and I didn't even realize it, we're working on, there's a number, and they're doing this great thing, and they're like, you know the song's called Chainsaw Reprise. Chainsaw. We've got Chainsaw back in there for it. I was like, oh, they're so smart. I love them. <laughs> and it's not the same, but it's that idea. And, and what the idea that they have done so well with this version. If there's something like, oh, I like, whether it's blue, better than you're welcome, they're going, actually, no, here's where we're smart. We're still giving you what you liked in blue, but we're giving you the better way, and it fits here. So that's a little tip. So, that could be the one. Yeah. so uh, other questions? Unless, uh, yeah. get back there. Um, so obviously you guys sort of uh, like struck gold with uh, you're welcome. And I Say that again, loudly. Everyone hear that? No. The, 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 the internet. <laughs> um, and I was reading on Playbill that you guys were considering mixing blue entirely, even in the. Yeah, we we, we don't we we consider it more. We're sending it out to a nice farm where we can run it. <laughs> <laughs> With your dog, you're all family dog. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. I mean, it's it's still in the version. If your company has licensed it already, like the new things yeah. are there. But we, we, to, to be to be clear, uh, 
We're in the process of retiring Blue yeah. from the show entirely. Okay. You're welcome. We'll, we'll become it's, the new uh, canonical so version. Clever. I yeah. mean, I, I love yeah. Yeah. Another question. Uh, right here. Um, I have kind of a specific question. So, um, excellent. <laughs> when I saw the movie for the first time, one of the most resonating images was when Heather Chandler comes back to talk to Veronica in the church and she's standing there like a wicked figure, kind of obviously from hell by the holy water. Um, but that, that's for a term. But in the original, like in the off Broadway one, um, She's not like that. She's in the same state where she died. She looks very pretty, and in fact, the old girl, I think, is where she sounds to me the very prettiest. So were you involved in making that decision from mm -hmm. her being kind of a hellish figure when she returns, or more of a neutral, almost like angelic figure, or was that a design decision? And either way, what was the reasoning? Uh, that's, let me, let me answer, that's kind of a two-part question, so let me try to answer it in two parts. From a design standpoint, uh, we decided we did not want to go for the grand guignol of showing the bullet holes and the dead jocks or showing, and, and we considered, you know, <laughs> do we put blue dye in her mouth and have her barf blue on herself or put blue all over it and make it look like a, like a zombie kind of thing? That, that seemed inappropriate because the second part of it is the reason it's that way dramatically is unlike the movie, she is an ongoing manifestation of Veronica's conscience. And Veronica has no reason to embellish or make, make them look deader than they were. It's kind of like the most, you know, it's, it's what they looked like the last time Veronica saw them alive was kind of the rule. And we didn't want, honestly, I, I just think that I would advise against anyone ever doing that in a production because I think it's kind of campy. And I think that you would probably, yes, get a, get a laugh if you had her, like, throat you know, rotted out, or it was like, you know, death becomes her kind of like gross out humor. <laughs> but then you would miss for the whole rest of the, that, that joke would, you'd get your laugh, that joke would get old in about eight seconds, and then you would miss all of the rest of the conversation, and it would distract from, you know, like when we bring the boys back. Um, well, football players in their underwear is always good for some of the audience. Always smaller shirts in the high school version. We, 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 we have had very few, few complaints about that off Broadway. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but the idea is that when the guys come back, it's in a very pivotal scene. It's a scene where Veronica, to save Martha's life, breaks her heart. And she does it to stop her from getting killed by, you know, killed by JD. And if we had this sort of like horror show going on behind them and it got all Beetlejuice, it, it would be showing the wrong thing at the wrong moment to the audience. So right so now they, why. they show up bare chested and or just completely in their underwear. Now imagine you showing up with a great big you know, bullet hole. That you, that, that's all you could look at. We want to look at their personality and their, and their character, their moral character and, and their goofiness as opposed to this, if that makes sense. So that's a great question. Uh, and because we're so fancy, we have a question of, like, someone tweeted in or the the interwebs. snapped us or something. Um, so, yeah, we are doing Snapchat, too. Guys, follow us. Um, oh. Thanks. Uh, so it's a two question because um, I think I one of the answers is a great one and the other one is a new one. Um, the first is, what are the future plans for Heathers? And then the second question is, how do you two feel about the ongoing rising popularity of Heathers the Musical in general? Can we do the first one or the second one? Well, the Heather's theme restaurant is <laughs> very. <laughs> Guy Fieri will be helping us in the name. BBQ. The Corn Nut Cafe, but um, <laughs> well, um, future plans for Heather's. Well, the li the last thing we just did is we just reunited Kevin and Andy and I. Got to work together for Andy the first Fickman, time. Our original record. Yeah, we got to work together for the first time in a while um, in London at an amazing theater called the Other Palace, a relatively brand new theater, uh, just sort of created by Andrew Lloyd Webber and some amazing theater uh, professionals, including Paul Taylor Mills, Kylie Vilsons, who are wonderful people who have brought a relatively brand new concept to to London, which is workshop theater, developmental theater, where you get to work on a show in front of an audience, some of whom actually pay uh, for tickets, but you, the audience under, understands you're working on it and what you see on Friday might be different from what you saw on Monday. And 
America has a huge tradition of workshops and labs and stuff, but it's not uh, nearly as big in London, so we benefited from that new fangled idea, and so we just got to go under uh, the hood and do further work on Heathers with an amazing cast of West End people. Um, if we're lucky, this might turn into a production next year in London. Um, keep your fingers crossed. Uh, and in terms of the, the other question was about uh, just the feeling about uh, Heather's making a connection, which I guess is kind of an awesomely softball question. So, <laughs> so again, being lazy, I'm happy to take that for myself. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really been amazing, and I think that's part of the impetus behind why it was so important for us to do the, the high school edition of the show, because we created by deliberate design or whether it's something we sort of discovered where the journey was taking us, you know, as we were actually on, on the journey, that I like the idea that people who don't know the movie are making a connection with the show. I love the fact that when I, you know, when I grew up doing community theater, the stuff that was in the American Musical Theater canon, that was, that was the stuff we did. I was, I was in Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. I was in, I was in uh, Once Upon a Mattress. Uh, I was in Music Man. Uh, you know, I, I ran lights for, for West Side Story. Like, all of these shows were shows that were important. And, and this, was, this was my social circle. It was like my friends and I, you know, we were backstage at South Pacific and we were making up, you know, songs to the familiar melodies. And that was, and, and, and some of my, my great, like, friendships and, you know, and, 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 you know, you know, long lost and unrequited loves were all against that backdrop. And that, you know, musical theater was kind of the soundtrack of my, uh, you know, of my teen years. And now it's many years later. And we have a better show. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 the, and the idea that, 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 you know, all you guys are, you know, caring enough to take your afternoon and come to hear us bloviate is, 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 is phenomenal because that means that musical theater is still building its canon, it's still building the catalog, and people are trying new things, and I, and I just think that's really proud, and it's like, I got a son who's nine, and he loves musical theater, and he just did Susical, he just did uh, the, the junior edition of Legally Blonde, and he's getting bitten by, he's getting bitten by the bug. Uh, 20 years ago, before Facebook, before you know social media, we were all tiny little communities of deeply ashamed theater nerds. Mm -hmm. right. Didn't know that maybe one town over there were other theater nerds just as shamed and, and yet <laughs> just as wonderful. We will never be silenced again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's actually something I, something that I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. And again, it's I think you know the you know the, the I, I presume there are many early adapters in this room, but you know you know. By the time we got to the UK for our, our workshop uh, three weeks ago, um, we were pleasantly shocked to discover from our cast that Heathers was already a thing in the UK. And there's never been a production of Heathers in the UK. We were the first time anybody ever did Heathers Anywhere Live. And Larry and I have deliberately kept it out of London, any, any, anywhere in, in that, because we want to we want to control how that how that that lays out. And it's because of social media. And it's because that Heather's fans have been finding each other and they've been following, you know, they've been following our, uh, you know, our, our Twitter account and they've been, you know, doing fan art. Like if you go on, like I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. If you look up Heather's animatics on YouTube, there is a huge library of incredibly like, gifted artists. I got to I have to give a shout out to a guy named Lemon Poppy Seed Muffin on YouTube. <laughs> That's his handle. I don't know who he is, but he does unbelievable like 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 Pixar quality animatics for our songs. And he doesn't make any money doing them. That's just love. We're just unbelievably flattered by that. There's dozens, hundreds of people who who have seized on us as an inspiration for their own creativity, which we is like Two, we've had two kids do uh, oh two fan arts for for the students. So I mean, it's like. I think another the, amazing the one is, 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 is look up Heather's in a nutshell. Oh yeah, which that's is one, I don't think you've seen this one yet. Yeah. But that is one of the funniest yeah. things I've seen in a long time. But, yeah. but the thing is, people are making connections, and this is something new. The technology has created a thing that uh, nerds now have the technology. To find each other, it's something that they really, you know, love and really have a connection to, they can they, they can they can create a thing, and you and you realize that for you know, there's a show that it's about making people feel that they're not alone out there in the universe. Social media is now making that true. 
and and I, I, I couldn't be happier to be like a little you know tiny brick in that wall. Cool. Other questions from this side. Almost Wait. no one's from this side. Uh, I was going way in the back, but then we'll come Wait. to this side. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Use your outside voice. Hello, project. <laughs> Diaphragm. Mm -hmm. who serves the role of, like, the friend that kind of gets abandoned, that's, like, nerdy. And then there's also Martha Gunshaw, who plays a lot smaller role than in the musical. I was just curious as to what, like, inspired you guys to sort of combine their roles and create this bigger, like, more prominent, almost, like, more powerful and influential character that is Martha Gunshaw in the musical, because she does kind of do more, and she, like, challenges people in the sense of like, oh no, I think there's foul play and stuff, and she hasn't grown tall, and just, she's a lot more present. And like. Well, I think the reason is, is that it was an economy of cast in a musical, and I think that Martha was so iconic, and she takes the strongest act, I'm talking about the movie, she takes the strongest action that she actually, uh, she, walk, she walks out into, into, into traffic mm -hmm. with, with, the, with the note. Uh, and people just remember her with, with the big fun t-shirt that she was just a really memorable bit of the movie. But most people don't remember that, oh wow, she didn't actually speak. Mm -hmm. And she was more kind of a, an abstraction like, oh, character-wise. Yeah. Betty Finn was the one that had all the lines, but Martha also didn't really have a connection to Veronica. And part of that is lovely at the end because Martha is a relative stranger that Veronica reaches out to and that act of kindness is, is wonderful. But I think what Larry and I were more interested in was seeing her, seeing Veronica make a connection and sort of make amends to her friend who she had wronged and abandoned and hurt. And it just seemed to make more sense to take the best of that character of Betty and that character, and that character of Martha and mushing them together. And I think that we chose to call her Martha partly because you had that great Martha Dunstock, Martha Dump Truck insult was so pivotal and also, once you had Veronica, then you had Betty, and suddenly you're thinking of Riverdale and Archie Comics, <laughs> and, which was what they were actually named after, so just Martha seemed the better way to go for us. Was it the orange shirt? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, so you guys cut blue, that's obvious. Um, what do you do with the, the blue freeze? Sword fight. Yeah, it's a different Well, <laughs> funny you mention that. We're, we're doing a bunch of things, so... Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, um, so, so in the version that you're going to see tomorrow, it's a song called Chainsaw, which is a reprise of your welcome, reprise of your welcome even though we don't say you're welcome, yeah. and it's because we, for people who are like kind of meta in their approach to, to Heather's, because we had to lose uh, Fuck Me Gently with a Chainsaw, we, we can say that, the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, internets. Uh, uh, <laughs> We, we, we thought, well, let's make the epithet that they lob at, at Veronica. Why don't we make a nod to Chainsaw without making it, you know, to sort of appease people who miss it without actually people that would be offend, deeply offended and get your teacher fired, uh, you know, not giving them any ammunition for that. So that's, that's that song. <clears throat> what we discovered, though, uh, in London was it's a little conceptual. And it takes, a, it takes a bit of thought, and because we do have the line, you know, fight me gently with, with a chainsaw later in act two, ha calling another song Chainsaw kind of steps on it because you're, you're a little puzzled as an audience. So what we actually did that I think is gonna end up in the, in, in the uh, canonical version is we did a reprise of the song uh, Big Fun, <laughs> which worked really, really well because the guys come out and they, they say it's, you know, that girl was on her, yeah, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> we, we, you won't be seeing that tomorrow, which is interesting because I'm very excited about seeing if our first guess for the reprise worked, and then we'll take what we learn from that tomorrow, and then maybe we might apply it to the new stuff, we might go back to the chainsaw stuff, but this is, we're in an amazing, uh, lucky situation now where brilliant artists and brilliant, you know, teenager <laughs> artists are actually workshopping our stuff for us, and we can take what we've learned and we can keep keep messing with it. Um, yeah, because we, we've got like yeah. we're learning from Pierce, we're yeah. learning from our, our, our workshop incubation period at, at the other palace. Yeah. 
Okay. We also have coming up, uh, my alma mater, Drew University, is going to do the new uh, canonical version in, in October that Larry and I are going to have, and Andy will have a chance to kind of be there and see how that works with a completely different cast. And then we also have um, one of our original cast members, uh, Dan Dominique, is uh, directing uh, a production in New York. I don't remember exactly where, but uh, Long Island, somewhere. New Orleans. But that's going to be another opportunity for us to see it. So what's really great here is because it's out in the world, we have an opportunity to pick and choose the versions that we sort of look at. And then everyone else in the world will just be doing the version that they've always done until we finally decide we're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someday. We've been doing it for a year. We've had four versions of <laughs> one song. It's still coming. I love it. Other question. We got new lines for Travis. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, right there. Um, do you believe that a uh, high school version of this show is the best way to reach teenagers with this show or just the most quickly affected? Are they in school or summer vacation? <laughs> and I'm, I'm quite serious, actually, because, um, oh, you had more. No, no, that's cool. Well, I, I, I mean that quite seriously because um, there's always a trade-off. Uh, schools are not democracies. You agree to go into a school and abide by their rules. And one of the main principles, I think we talked about this in the last uh, session, is that the main reason why you will take a Sweeney Todd and you will cut out some of the, the terrifying stuff or the swear words out of Greece is because not all people grow up at the same rate. You guys are awesome and brave. You came here to a conference. You guys, you know, some of you are probably 15 years old and yet here you are, grown up enough to come here and deal with scary topics and work on shows that contain scary topics, but not all your classmates are. So administrations, teachers, educators, principals, school district people have to weigh that. How fast is too fast to, to expose a young person to an idea that can traumatize them? There are certain things that I saw way too young, um, and I am traumatized by them today. I wish that I had not learned or been exposed to this or that idea. And so that is a kind of a kindness. So. Yeah, it would be nice if, and it would be great if we hadn't had to put in the extra work to come up with a, a version <laughs> containing no swear words. Oh, wouldn't it be great if all of our dirtiest swear words would be fine? And yet, look what happened as a result of us of having to go back and, and rework stuff. In many cases, we've improved things to the point where we're going to put them in the, into the grown-up version. So I think it's great to have these two different versions. I think it is absolutely a good idea to tailor your material occasionally to know your audience, if it makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we're just lucky to get the chance to do it, and we learn more and more uh, the more we, the, the, the more different groups we do it for. And, and something for my theatrics, who is fortunate enough to work with them and, and guide as much as we can and, and help in all those things, is what we like to tell people is your school might want to do some things, but if they're going to make a bunch of changes, Either they have to send in all of the notes to Samuel French and say, can we make all of these changes? And Samuel French then has to go to talk to someone and say yes or no. And what right, might work for you might not work for them. And can all of these different things. So if we can go to the authors who are hopefully willing and they can go, great. They all want to make changes. They're all going to want to do this. Can you give them your best version of the show so you know you're getting what you want out there rather than their interpretation of what they want your best version to be? Then... We know from our job and we know from Lysen's house that that's what's happening out there and that's a better thing. We talked early on at one point, they asked um, about, oh, can we have alternates? Can we just say, okay, if you can't say this, do this? And we said, well, the minute you say that once, everyone goes, oh, well, if they didn't mind that, they won't mind if we change this line back or they won't mind if we change this line back. So once you give them a bunch of options, so that's why we eventually say, no, you have to give them one choice and then hopefully they get their best version out there. Uh, I want to add one thing, because I think your, your, your question is very interesting. I want to maybe answer it in, in, a, in a slightly different way. Is <clears throat> The question would be, do we think that giving, is this, sh is this the best way to reach teens or the fastest? And I don't think it's the best way to reach, but I think it's part of an overall solution, because if this, show is nothing more than a spark plug to ignite conversations on topics that people should be talking about. Um, 
I think that's a good use of having of, of writing and, pro and producing a musical. Um, if, if people w walk out and have conversations with their teachers and they have conversations with their friends and they have conversations about are you you know because you naturally are, are, are inclined to go oh are you a are you a Veronica are you a Chandler are you a Mac are you a, are you a Duke and looking at why you are or are not those archetypes that appear in the, are you a Martha why those archetypes appear in the show whether you're whether you're male whether you're female what you know what whatever um, I think it helps understand where you fit because there are patterns that do recur in high school life and I think that being able to identify, you know Mean Girls is all about you know that 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 pattern and um, you know, the book Queen Bees and Wannabes is a book it was, it was one of the books that we read researching this um, I need to look there's a chapter on a lifeboat metaphor which I, I don't know how that got into our show uh, <laughs> but, uh, but 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 I think that it's it is a great tool and I think that it probably is not best or fastest but I don't know that there is any one like magic, you know, you know, magic panacea that, that gets that gets people talking about something. I think it's got to be a lot of different things all kind of rolling in concert. Anyway, really good question. Yeah. Uh, over here. Yeah. So you guys talk a lot about how you wanted to change, you know, you wanted to bring the stage in sense because it tells like this true story of high school and it kind of gives you that message when it wasn't there before. So how hard was it for you to cut down the show that was like so real to high school to almost fit high school standards? Like when I was trying to tell, I don't know what it's like. But it was, to tell this true story. Well, that's the thing because it's possible to be cruel to your classmates without swearing at them. <laughs> it's possible to betray your friends without, you know, a cigarette in your hand. Or, or a joint in your hand. In other words, there's always a trade-off. There's always a community standard that will that you'll either obey or you'll 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 violate. And if you violate it, you'll pay a price. It'll be small or it'll be big. So we would much rather get the um, word out. We'd rather much rather get the songs performed. We'd much rather get the, what's the word, uh, money from the <laughs> various schools and hopefully retain as much as possible of the truths we're trying to identify, the messages we're trying to get out, and so we don't get to say it, you know, so we don't get to say certain words that we love to say. <laughs> eh, you know, um, we, uh, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm older, we went to high school, uh, we were swearing like sailors. We were doing terrible things. There were, there were teenagers young, as young as 15, 16, doing super grown up stuff. I remember sometimes going, oh, isn't it a shame we're not allowed to, to do this by law? <laughs> sometimes I was like, oh, isn't it terrible that they're doing this? We're, we're too young for this. So, um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. but. <laughs> But yes, we were trying to be true to the experience of high school. But I'd rather get it done than not, and I'd rather retain the essential parts of it. Um, so I, I've, got, yeah. I've got an example, like just having actually been in real uh, high school in uh, not 1989, but uh, in, in, in 1985, is part of the high school experience at that point was every single person you know, who stood outside wearing boots, like everybody smoked and everybody smoked on school property and that wasn't a problem. And faculty like smoked in the school yeah, and if you're being, if you're, if you, you know, and there's a sort of thing where, because it was, we, we originally had everybody smoking in like one of our original developmental productions. And we took that out because it just, it was kind of a distraction, even though it was accurate and truthful in a historical Way, it wasn't actually getting down to the tr to, to to the truth of the, the relationship part of the show. And I would use it as a contrasting example, something that is not a problem for us to say, but I think is one of the ugliest, most cutting, most unfair insults. Is and, and, I'm, and I'm very proud of it because it took us forever to kind of think of the right thing for uh, for 
for Kurt to say after Veronica uh, tell, tells him off and says, you know, your, your future gas station attendant, and you're waiting, you're waiting for him to like, oh my God, is he going to hit her? Is he going to like, is he, is he going to cur you know curse at her? What's he going to do? And he just says, you got a zit right there, which instantly is just, and everyone laughs, and and, and like I can't think of anything. You know, from when I was in high school, that would be crueler than have someone at that moment where you've just poured your heart out to completely dismiss everything you've said and just point out a physical imperfection that you probably <laughs> sat and worried about. Do I cover it up? Do I put makeup on? Like that. That like like for me, that's that's very real and that's very true. And you don't need the profanity. You don't need uh, all. You know, you you don't need all of the other bells and whistles. Like that stuff's great, but if you set the tone. I will say, and, and kind of going after the question, uh, Big Fun being the example in the, in the party, they still have all the stuff happening. It's a party. If at your school, your director decides that you're all going to be drinking or doing other things that are cut from the lyrics and cut, that's fine. That's your director's choice to make that about that as going on. But what they've done is made sure that that wasn't the crutch to get the point across in the, all of that. You just reminded me, one of my things that I was so hoping we would do when we were first writing this show, and we did get it in by the time Big Fun was done, was the premise, go ahead, wreck your parents' house, mm -hmm. they'll pay for it. Yeah. And we had some other songs that didn't deal with that, and I was like, oh, I hope someday we'll, and sure enough, finally, Big Fun came around, we had that line, so let the speakers blow, they'll buy another stereo, which spoke both to the kids being crappy kids, obnoxious, you know, entitled dicks, and also <laughs> to their parents being either oblivious or, or, or enabling that. Or enabling that. So and fun, so now that is a bigger part of the Big Fun song. Previously we talked about, oh, drink this, smoke that, but we don't, that's gone, but you can put the solo cups in the staging if you want. Yeah. But I love that we still have a, a, a core of the, the kids, the popular kids, because that song t is only for the popular kids, because the nerds don't get invited to that party. And they're singing about how, how happy we are to be the rich kids, how happy we are to be the popular ones who get to, to trash our houses and disrespect our parents and, and get away with it. And I, I, I like that we get to talk about that. In other words, when we did the workshop and removed all the swear words and removed all the references to alcohol and, and et cetera, et cetera, if what we had been left with had made us unhappy, we would have scrapped it. If what we had been left with was a weak pay limitation of Heather's, we wouldn't have gone ahead with it because we would have been like, it's not worth it. It would have, it would have lowered the, our opinion of the overall brand. But we're very happy with it because we, we think we, that the story of Heather's is more than that. The, the DNA is unmistakable from the film to the grown-up version to the high school edition. We think that it's still dealing with some terrifying things, upsetting things, and also, also hopeful things. So, uh, with luck, you'll let us know if you agree tomorrow. Okay, we are out of time. Sadly, do you have any last comment you want to make? Anyone? Uh, I, I had a good tweet when you guys were doing that the live tweet the last time of the about the 101 and someone said what is this heather's kids club edition <laughs> and, and then i was feeling incredibly witty that day and i said yeah if heather had an older cousin with a fake id nice. so because there's i mean even the purists who've seen the show love the I did, I did have one overall thought, and this is a, a request for both, for all of you guys. We did it last session too, which is, if you are thinking of writing something, write it. If you don't like it, write it again, or write something else. But you guys are the future. Even you, you performers who have not thought about writing, you have stories inside you. You have things that make you indignant, that make you scared and angry, things that make you hopeful that people tend to forget about. And so... Um, We've done our part. Hopefully we have more shows in us, but we're just, right now, we're just two white guys <laughs> trying to write about what women, what young women feel and think. With luck, we've done a decent job, but we're also tremendously excited to see what you guys are going to write, because your experiences are hopefully going to become the great shows of tomorrow or 10 years from now. And so if, if, 
you guys come, if you come up to us 10 years from now and say, hey, you spoke to us and you inspired me to write a much better show than Heather's, we'll be <laughs> so excited to hear that. Thanks. Thank